The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on China Africa relations through training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, joining us today from beautiful Berlin, Germany. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, for much of the past year, regular listeners of the show will know that we have been talking about the sharp decline of Chinese lending to African countries that has been underway really since 2016, but has accelerated in the post-pandemic era. We've had a number of conversations with various stakeholders who've given it a name, the small but beautiful era, small is beautiful, small and beautiful. I don't know how they want to call it, but basically the most important thing to hear that is small. The drop-off in lending, though, has been more extreme now than I think a lot of people anticipated. And we actually now know what it looks like. What does small actually look like? Well, it turns out that the Chinese Loans to Africa database that's managed by the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, they've just updated all the new information for 2021 and 2022. And it is very revealing. Let me just walk through some of the key findings that we're going to deep dive today and that I want to get your take on. In the 22-year period from 2000 to 2022, uh, that's the latest data, 39 Chinese lenders provided 1,243 loans, amounting to $170 billion. Altogether, they did that with 49 different African governments and seven regional institutions. Now, just to put some perspective there for you, that $170 billion is about two-thirds of what the World Bank lent to African countries in that same period. So you can see the incredible outsized role that Chinese lending played throughout much of the early 2000s. Now, for 2021 and 2022, this is where it gets very interesting. Only 16 new loan commitments worth just $2.22 billion from Chinese lenders to African government borrowers. And this marks two consecutive years of lending to Africa below $2 billion. Now, let's break down those loans. In 2021, just seven loans totaling $1.22 billion were signed. And in 2022, nine loans at $994 million were signed. That is the lowest point in Chinese lending in 20 years. This is absolutely revealing. Now, the two largest lenders, of course, are the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank. The China Exim Bank continues to be the top lender to African governments, accounting for about two-thirds of the loans made in 21 and 22. CDB provided no loans in 21, but did a small $14 million loan in 22, for a co-finance project. So, Cobus, this is a dramatic drop. This should be very sobering for African policymakers, who many of which still have not caught up with the realities of Chinese lending where they are today and are thinking that it's still 10 years ago. And this really puts a lot of pressure on Chinese policymakers in terms of where they're going to go to get financing, because China now is not in the business of making big loans to African countries anymore. Yes, I mean, this is certainly the beginning or, or, you know, kind of a new sign of a new era, I think, in, in, in the relationship. And we did a special edition around this report where we were also focusing on emerging talking points in the Africa-China relationship in preparation, or it seems to, there seems to be in preparation for the agenda setting that will happen for the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, uh, the FOCAC Summit that's happening next year. And there it was interesting that the things that the, the Chinese and African leaders, um, and this emerged from the China-Africa leaders roundtable dialogue that happened on the sideline of the BRICS Summit in, in late August in, in Johannesburg. So what they were focusing on is like focusing on, on, on Chinese Chinese kind of support for African industrialization, for African agricultural modernization, and for training. So it was very interesting to then see the different, like how the lending has also shifted, not only in terms of the amounts, but also the sectors, you know, with kind of an emerging kind of sector, like more lending around.
ground training, for example, like more environmental lending. And the report also highlights very kind of interesting kind of examples of environmentally focused lending that's emerging in, in the China-Africa relationship. So the large fall in lending is one interesting part of the story. And then where the lending is going is another interesting part of the story. Well, let's find out more about the data, the trends, how we got here and where we're going. And we're joined by one of the researchers who put together the new data set on the Chinese Loans to Africa database. Again, that's managed by BU at the Global Development Policy Center there. Torella Moses is a data analyst and database manager at the Global China Initiative at Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. Torella is a co-author on this new report with Jiong Huang, Lucas Engel, and Victoria Yvonne Bien-Aimé. want to make sure we give them credit for all the great work that they did on this. A very good morning to you, Torella. Welcome back to the show. Good morning, Eric and Kopis. Thanks for having me. Torella, this was rather surprising to see the fact that we are now at the lowest point in lending in the past 20 years. Did the findings take you by surprise? Or as somebody who's been immersed in this for the past couple of years, were you expecting these findings? You know, based on the fact that Chinese lending has, according to our data, peaked in 2016, we were to an extent expecting a lower level of loans, given that we were also doing research on the 2021 to 2022 period, which are still the pandemic years. However, when we looked at the actual lending amounts, which you mentioned was 2.2 billion, 1.2 billion of that given in 2021 for seven loans, and then almost a billion of that given in 2022 for nine loans, we were quite um, surprised at how low the amount was based on these estimates that we were able to put together. However, again, given just the factors of the pandemic and certain data trends, as well as policy rhetoric that we had been seeing coming out of China, when we started looking at the overall picture and doing analysis, these low levels started to make more sense. Tarana, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the database that you were working with. Like, how does one actually get the information about this lending and how did you manage to track these changes? Yes. So the Chinese Loans to Africa database is a database where we collect loan commitments signed between Chinese lenders and African governments, their state-owned enterprises and regional institutions. So we depend a lot on official sources which we look for on African government websites. So think of your Ministry of Finance or Debt Management offices, or even certain ministries specific to certain sectors, such as the energy sector. We also make sure that we cross-check our findings with official sources from the Chinese side. So we look at reports on Chinese embassy websites or Ministry of finance and commerce websites from China. And oftentimes, um, we also look at media reports that may be state-owned media reports. In very few cases, we do have researchers that go into certain countries and may get information directly from the ministries, and that really helps us confirm a lot of our loans as well. So we call this manual forensic internet sleuthing, Yeah, and it's been quite helpful for finding the information that we've been able to collect. It's hard work and very tedious, but it's really the only way to do this kind of research, isn't it? Absolutely, because as you both know, it's not available publicly from the China side, and so There's a lot of reliance that we have to do on the recipient side, as well as just publicly available reports. Okay, well, let's kind of deep dive now into some of the key findings. Tell us a little bit about where Chinese lending is taking place now, because there's been some shifts in the geography of lending. And then Kobus referenced the fact that there's been some changes in the priorities that the Chinese have in terms of what they're financing. Give us the headlines on those two areas. Absolutely. So I'll start from the borrower side. There were eight African borrowers. And what we notice is that the majority of the amount of loans were directed to West African borrowers, specifically Benin, Senegal, and Ivory Coast. And this stood out to us because in previous years, most of the amounts of loans have been directed to Southern and Eastern Africa. And this may be for various reasons, one of them being that Many of China's top 10 um, African borrowers tend to be from these regions. And also at the inception of the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, East Africa was the region that was most incorporated into the BRI at the beginning in 2013. 
This has changed over the years. And we have seen in most recent years, Senegal hosted FOCAC in 2021. And generally, these three borrowers and just the West African region as a whole has borrowed less from China on the whole. And so it seems like maybe this may be a diversification of just exposure to certain regions as well. In terms of sectors, we have seen a continuous kind of financing for top sectors, such as the transportation sector and the ICT sector. But some of the newer sectors to us for these two years that stand out include the environment sector, where we saw that in Senegal, we saw that the Chinese government provided a loan for kind of ecosystem resilience within a certain region to prevent desertification and really to address the lack of access to water that was affecting agricultural activities, the ecosystem, as well as socioeconomic activity. We also saw financing for an e-government project, which we've seen in the past before. And so it really exemplifies a continuous focus on the ICT sector. But then some other sectors also stood out, such as education, water, sanitation and waste, and even defense. So what struck me also was that in comparison to the 2000 to 2020 block of data and the, the newer laws of the last two years, before there was a lot of lending for energy and the energy lending has essentially like disappeared now. And in, in the report, there was a comment that this might be a temporary situation. So I wonder if you could clue us in a little bit about what the situation is with energy lending. Energy lending has historically received the most amount of financing from China and much of that financing has been to fossil fuel um, heavy projects. And so with China's focus on this greener BRI, and it seems that across the global south where China has tended to lend, there has been an absence of this sovereign loan commitments towards energy projects. These projects are often large scale projects. They're definitely, you know, contributing to a country's energy access or at least access to kind of economic resources that may come out of extracting or gaining access to more energy through those projects. However, you know, with China's focus on greeting the BRI, it seems like there's this temporary pause while China starts to consider, especially from the Chinese lender point of view, what projects that they can be focusing on that fit under this new green BRI focus, projects that could be more, you know, renewable energy focus in scope, but also um, have this kind of economic feasibility that's now needed for these large scale projects. You know, I'm looking at the data set and I'm looking at some of the historical information as well. So when we look back at the top borrowers in Africa from 2022, what stands out is either the countries were resource rich, so in this case, Angola or Cameroon, or they were strategic, such as Ethiopia or Kenya. And I'm still just trying to get my head around why the shift to these smaller West African countries like Ivory Coast. And again, this may not be part of the purview as a database manager, but it's just, do you have any insights as to what might be driving the shift to lending away from the traditional resource-rich or strategic countries to the smaller West African countries? Not to say that they're not necessarily, Benin obviously has resources, but they're not as strategic for the Chinese. I'm just trying to understand what the thinking might be. Yes, this was something that also stood out to us because when we did our analysis of just focusing on top 10 borrowers, if you're able to read the report, you would see that there is a figure that we have where you see that lending just really appears flat. There's no increase or even decrease for any of these lenders in the pandemic year period. And I think the most prominent factor that we can attribute this to is the issue with debt within these countries. So for example, if we're looking at Angola, Ethiopia, Zambia, and even Ghana, four of those countries were really involved in several debt negotiations, um, some that are still ongoing, and then debt discussions as well. So we know that Ethiopia, Zambia, and Ghana have been involved in discussions under the G20 Common Framework. Angola specifically received debt deferment from China during the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, but even beyond that period in time as well. And then several of these other countries were also participants of the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. 
or we're in a state of high risk of debt distress that we think to an extent um, had an effect on the ability to for these countries to take on new loans, but also for China to even supply those new loans. And I think there's a great example of this where we saw reports in Ethiopia of China Export Import Bank pausing on providing at least disbursements for certain loans and then even settling on new loan commitments because there was concern about adding to Ethiopia's debt burdens. I was also struck, as you mentioned, by the rise of defense as a portion of of the lending. So I was wondering if we could talk a little bit more about what kind of defense spending that is. And is it a situation that it's now looking more prominent because the total amount of lending is, is smaller? So what would have fallen under a kind of a general other category is now showing up as a portion of the pie chart? Or is there actual pivot to defense lending happening at the moment? I think it's kind of the first that you mentioned that because it's such a small amount of loans, um, these loans to sectors that we wouldn't normally focus on in the past just tend to stand out a little bit more compared to some of the other sectors that have historically received the most amount of lending from China. So specific to the defense sector, we saw multiple loans from the China National Aerotechnology Import and Export cooperation, or CETIC as it's known, to several projects, one of them being in Angola for the Air Force, and this was for technical assistance specifically. And then we saw another one to also in Angola for the purchase of military assets, also for the Air Force as well. And so those two loans, those in addition to another loan in Ghana that was given to military hospitals, those three loans kind of make up this amount that seems prominent. However, all of these loans were slightly under $100 million. So the first loan that I mentioned to the Air Force for technical assistance was around $30 million. The second loan that I mentioned for military assets and purchase of equipment for the Air Force was $19 million. And then the last one for military hospital expansion in Ghana was $85 million. So again, smaller in amount but they tend to stand out given such um, low levels for these, these years. It's funny, when I saw those military loans being part of the equation, it made me think that in many ways, China is starting now to resemble Western governments because the United States, for example, uses export credits and loans as well to support its defense industry. And in many ways, this idea that the first 20 years of the 2000s, that China surged up to $170 billion in loans, as you have, you guys have documented so well, in many ways might be an historical aberration, and that China today is just going back to what a normal major power country does in its lending. And I'm curious to hear if the current state of Chinese lending, how different it is, say, from other major lenders like the Japanese, the Europeans, or the Americans. What does the profile look like in context? Yeah, great question, Eric. I think that at first, we have to kind of think about the answer to this question from where Chinese contractor as well as Chinese lenders' strengths lie. So as you mentioned, historically, financing has been to infrastructure-related sectors. This is, I think, directly related to contractor kind of strengths and being able to build roads and build airports and, you know, contribute to rail infrastructure, for example. So we still see examples of that, as mentioned in 2021 and 2022, for the transport sector. However, some of this focus on education, on health, on financial um, services, and, and some of these ICT, for example, more so mirror those of the World Bank, for example. And that- even USAID. I mean, that's a very, that's right out of the USAID playbook. Absolutely. And so, These would be in the category of what we call soft infrastructure, which historically has been within the wheelhouse of the World Bank. And then, as you mentioned, some others in the U.S. and Europe as well. So this move towards that while still maintaining the level of expertise that they kind of have um, shaped within the infrastructure related heavy sectors, I think is quite interesting to continue to follow and see how it compares to others.
As Eric mentioned at the top, this trend in Chinese lending in official languages come to be known as small and beautiful phase or approach. Um, so I was wondering, from now having immersed yourself in this data, can like what what does small and beautiful look like to you from having looked at at the hard numbers? Yeah, so this was one of the things we decided to do to get a better context of the lens over time. And we looked at three-year averages across multiple years within the data set. And what we found that is from 2017 to 2019, which are the pre-pandemic years to the pandemic years of 2020 to 2021, average loan amounts dropped by 37%. We also saw the number of loans go from 184 loans to just 32 loans between those two separate time periods. So for us, what we're seeing when it comes to the small or beautiful, or small is beautiful depending on who you are and how you want to use those terms, what we see when it comes to this approach is we're seeing less large-scale loans over 500 million. We're seeing more loans under 100 million as well which slightly differs from, I think, what is typically under the small or beautiful framing, which is usually under 50 million, um, but we're seeing under 100 million, and then we're just seeing a less number of loans. Um, I think a good example of what fits in the actual you know, definition that we've identified based on research of the Small is Beautiful approach is this co-finance project that CDB provided $14.74 million for in Senegal. It was for a waste management project. And what we found is that when they released a report about that loan, they said this is an example of a Small is Beautiful loan that is you know, meant to be beneficial for the host country. And so we continue to see an alignment with the data, at least with the rhetoric we keep hearing about small and or beautiful. So you hear us fumbling around with this small and or is but beautiful. <laughs> and let me just explain a little bit about what, why that is. So the terms in Chinese are xiao er mei, xiao er qian mei. And so that's small, moreover, beautiful. And it lacks precision and doesn't translate very well. Some people have translated it as small and beautiful. Others have translated small but beautiful. Kobe, you remember we had Edwin Lee, who was a Beijing-based project finance attorney, and he insisted on small but beautiful. And the idea here is that these projects, as Torella pointed out, are small, which is defined as sub $50 million, or beautiful, and beautiful in this context may be larger than $50 million, but it's got buy-in from the local community. It has a high ESG rating, that's the sustainability and green rating, or it is politically important to the Chinese, and so therefore is accepted as an exception to some of the other rules on financing. And so those bigger projects we're seeing out here in Southeast Asia and Central Asia. And I guess, Torella, this brings up the point, and I'm not sure if you guys at BU have this visibility, but I'm going to ask the question anyway, is that we've seen this dramatic plunge in lending both in Africa, also in the Americas, and your colleagues at BU have also been tracking lending in the Americas. How does this compare to, say, here in Southeast Asia or other parts of the world, maybe even the Middle East, where Chinese interest is considerably higher? And we're still talking about big railway programs. When the Vietnamese prime minister met with Prime Minister Li Qiang just last week, they're talking about building a big high-speed rail between Vietnam and China. These are conversations that don't happen anymore in Africa, but they're still happening out here in Southeast Asia. I'm wondering if you have any visibility about the context with which Africa lies in, in terms of Chinese overseas lending more broadly? Absolutely. I think I can talk from um, specifically the development finance institution lens, so the Export-Import Bank of China and China Development Bank lending lens. And we have another data set called the China's Overseas Development Finance data set, where users can compare different regions and the different loan amounts that go to those regions. And we still see a decrease, at least from these two development finance institutions, to the Asia region overall. And unfortunately, I don't have the specific breakdown within Asia, but overall, we do see a decrease. However, it's not as sharp as compared to um, what's happening in Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean. 
And, uh, you know, kind of, I know that it's very hard to make any kind of future predictions, but is your sense that this kind of downward trajectory is just going to continue and that, that, that lending will essentially completely dry up? Or do you think there might be a chance that some of this lending might start creeping back up, particularly a year or two down the line if China has managed to start dealing with some of its domestic economic issues? Absolutely. So lending, based on just what we're seeing will rebound, but not to previous levels. And we think that this new approach, you know, this small and or beautiful approach, greening the BRI, you know, trying to manage addressing how to provide lending when several African governments that historically have engaged with China have high debt profiles will really, you know, limit the amount of lending that can be large in scope from previous years that we have seen. At the same time, I think we see this shift at least to more discussion and more mention of beneficial social and environmental projects. We still see there is an interest in the region and also demand from African governments but then there has, in terms of response to a demand, it seems that China is still in this state of recalibrating the lending relationship. The lending relationship has played such a huge role in establishing various other parts of the China-Africa relationship, such as, you know, strengthening diplomatic ties and even leading to economic integration making a way for increased trade. And so we think that, you know, lending, because it has played such a crucial role in really strengthening the relationship, will still continue, but it, it won't look the same as we have seen in the past. And um, there will be new areas of focus, just as our data is showing from the 2021 and 2022 periods. Okay, Torella, I want to close our discussion with a crazy theory. And I want to see if you think that I'm completely bonkers here, but this is one of my things that I've been thinking about here, okay? I'm not putting on my tin hat, but it is kind of maybe close to it. So maybe there's a reason why in 22, the lending fell so much is because in 2024, that is 2024 next year, we're going to have a FOCAC in Beijing. Now, FOCAC is the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Normally, the Chinese like to have these really big numbers 20 billion, 60 billion, 60 billion again, these huge numbers. Last FOCAC, they promised big numbers. They didn't really deliver on a lot of it, but quite a bit of it they did. Is it possible? Okay. And again, this is all speculation, hypothetical, but I don't know. Is it possible that they communicating out to African governments to say, you know what? Hold your projects or submit your bids for what you want us to do because we're going to be saving up things for the 2024 FOCAC so that we can have a big number, but we can't spend big in 21, 22, and 23, and then into the big FOCAC. Is it possible that they said, our economy is taking some hits right now, we don't have the cash that we used to have, but we're still going to commit to spending, but we want to consolidate it all around a big FOCAC splash that will take place in 2024 in Beijing. Do you think there's any possible linkage between the sharp downturn that we've saw in the past two years and the coming FOCAC? Eric, I think there may be an element of that. But I think also with previous FOCACs, there has been more of a focus on future commitments and more of a discussion of where the areas of focus are for the next three years, right, before the next FOCAC. And so my understanding is that at least in the next FOCAC, we'll be able to understand, you know, how all of this data and all this rhetoric really is fitting into how China is viewing the relationship overall, but also the relationship specific to lending and development finance. I don't get the sense that these projects are being held just because there's so many different lenders and stakeholders involved in putting a, a project together. Different projects have different timelines. There are different you know, stages of negotiations that may go into a project. So it doesn't seem to me like they would just be held in order to prepare for one major kind of event, but rather this is really 
an indication of a change in how lenders are viewing certain projects and how they may be deciding which ones to take on versus which ones to not take. That's kind of what I thought. It requires too much coordination in order to pull off something like that. Listen, everybody, if you are following the China-Africa relationship, even cursory, you need to read these reports. You need to understand the data. I'm going to kind of point everybody into two points now. Smaller and greener new data reveals a shift in Chinese loans to Africa. That is the main policy brief by the Boston University team led by Torella Moses and joined by her co-authors as well, Ji Jong Huang, Lucas Engel, and Victoria Yvonne Bien-Aimé, who all work together collaboratively on this new update of the data set. You have to understand what's going on here. Then also Torella was kind enough and penned a column for us as well, A New State of Lending, Chinese Loans to Africa. She also has been doing some writing in the Africa report. We're going to put links to all of these articles and the data set in the show notes. This is required reading for everybody who wants to understand what's going on because the shifts are profound. Torella, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and to explain everything about what's going on. The work you guys are doing is absolutely fantastic and it's invaluable. As I said, it is tedious work and we're so grateful that you are doing it because it helps inform us and hopefully others as well. If people want to follow what you're reading and writing these days, I know you're on social media. Can you let everybody know where they can find you? Absolutely. You can find me on X now, as it's called. At That is what it's called. It sounds weird to say, but that's what it's called. does sound very weird. Um, but I'm at Tarella Moses, T-A-R-E-L-A, and then Moses. Or you can find me on LinkedIn um, and type in the same name as well. We will put links to both the LinkedIn handle as well as the X handle as well. Torella, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric and Kobus. <laughs> Kobus, there is no way to overstate the importance of these findings. And it is just absolutely fascinating to see how the plunge from 2016 just continues to less than a billion dollars. These are numbers that, as long as you and I have been covering the story, we thought we would never see it go down this low. Or we maybe we imagined it, but here we are. And this is a reality that I'm not entirely sure that many presidents and prime ministers across the continent have fully woken up to because we continue to hear them talk about China funding railroads and ports and big large scale infrastructure projects that they haven't gotten the memo about the small and beautiful era that we're in today. More importantly, though, is on the Chinese side, it seems absolutely foundational to the China African narrative that loans have been part of what they do. And they're going to have to completely reinvent their talking points and their engagement strategy because absent loans, this is what a lot of people have associated with China, Africa. And you've talked about this in some of your analysis this week, and Torella referred to it in some of her comments as well, that this is a shift both for the African side, but as much for the Chinese side. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be very interesting to see how they pivot their diplomacy and their kind of messaging. You know, I, I think that Chinese diplomats will probably say that, well, the funding has always been in the context of South-South cooperation. But I think for a lot of a lot of African countries, China is pretty far away. The reason China was such a big player on the continent was because of the funding. So it'll be interesting to see whether China's own influence on the continent gets kind of reset a little bit in comparison. But it will also that will also depend on where other kinds of funding is coming from. Maybe, but we're going to get a first indication of that next year when Afrobarometer, which is the most reputable, incredible polling agency on the continent that does public opinion surveys. And if you recall from earlier this year when we interviewed Afrobarometer CEO Joseph Asunka, and he said that he's expecting Chinese public opinion in Africa to go down because there's just not as much presence of the Chinese because they're not funding the infrastructure anymore. You're not seeing the big projects anymore. People aren't seeing the tangible benefits of China-Africa engagement. All of these initiatives like green, sustainability, tech, those are things you don't actually physically see. That was one of the problems with Western aid, which was focused on health and humanitarian issues. People in their everyday lives didn't see it. So let's keep an eye out for the Afrobarometer data to see if public opinion about the Chinese falls. Another interesting thing here is that in many ways, again, I think the Chinese are falling into a normal profile 
of a major power lender. And these past 25 years were just historically exceptional that they were just flush with cash from this amazing economic boom that they've had for the past 40 years. We've never seen economic growth like this in human history. It occurred faster and improved the lives of more people than any other period in human history. But that means that this exceptional period in Chinese economic growth is over now. China's economic development profile looks a lot more like that of a major power, of a more mature industrial economy. So one, two, three percent growth a year. And so they're not going to be shedding off all this cash that they have to find something to do with. So those days are over. We're in a structural change now that will never come back again. Yeah, and I mean, that reset was long overdue in the Chinese economy. You know, that rapid growth obviously was great for China, but it also caused a lot of problems in China. And so, you know, now there is this, uh, you know, new era where, where some of those problems, including a, a very large debt situation within China, has to be dealt with in some kind of way. So how that reset is going to play out in Africa will be interesting. You know, like what the effect will be on, for example, you know, development project financing and so on. We, we will need to be tracked. I wonder if African governments will continue to be as deferential to the Chinese in the future if there is no connection to money the way there's been. Now, again, I don't want to say that China-Africa relations in every sense are purely transactional. It's far more complex than that. This is a multi-layer, multifaceted relationship between African countries and China. However, at some level, there is this idea that there's a big pot of gold on the other side of the Great Wall. And I wonder if that sense that, you know what, the Chinese don't have the cash anymore, so maybe we don't have to be quite as deferential to them on certain issues, those red line issues. Or maybe they, people will see that our interests lie with other powers that may not be aligned with the Chinese. And so will the politics change, do you think, five, ten years out from now, if money is not the major linkage between these African countries and China? Quite possibly. I think the politics will, will definitely change, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will simply be a reset to mostly Western influence. I think it'll then the landscape of influence will get a lot more complicated, not least in part because, you know, obviously there's many Chinese actors and many Chinese, you know, channels of capital. So it's not necessarily that Chinese lending itself is, is drying up, but that, you know, that the, the Chinese lending landscape is changing a lot and, and, and so on. But, but there will also be a lot of other actors emerging. So you know, it, it'll be a more crowded field, I expect. So it'll be fascinating to see how it develops. Well, let's stay with the debt story, but move on to a few other headlines that crossed over the past week. Zambian President Haikinde Shilema spent six days in China last week. Looked like a wonderful trip. I mean, beautiful trip. He went to Shenzhen and then he went sightseeing through Fujian. And then he went to the, the kind of, his, you know, the founding of the Communist Party areas and he did Huawei and CATL and BYD. And I just wonder when these African presidents like Hishilema, but also Felix Chesikedi as well, they go for a week long trip. And you don't see this with other presidents and prime ministers like the Europeans and the Americans will fly in for one day and then fly back out. So I always find it so interesting that they spend so much time and they spend time again on these what look like sightseeing cultural excursions rather than what's going to actually be benefiting their countries on a business trip. It always just kind of I find it remarkable. However, that being said, Hishinlema comes back and he says, hey, I had a great time, this was wonderful, we want in Zambia to follow the same economic trajectory that China faced and China, you know, succeeded in, all that's great. Okay, fine. Now, what actually came out of this trip? And I was really trying to understand, there was an upgrade in diplomatic relations to, you know, the Chinese have all these hierarchies of diplomatic relations, strategic comprehensive partnerships, strategic partnership, comprehensive partnerships, I mean, all these different levels. I'm not entirely sure that makes a huge difference. Sure, okay, they got an upgrade in diplomatic ties. They signed six MOUs, but you know MOUs, right? I mean, who knows if those things come through or don't, right? They're not binding agreements. They're not contracts. And so effectively, here we have another African president going to China and coming back with a pat on the back and a thank you for visiting us. What he didn't come back with and what everybody wanted to see was did China publicly commit and ratify the June debt restructuring deal? This was the deal signed back in June in France 
with the major creditors that they all agreed to in principle, but now needs to be ratified. And the Chinese could have sent a signal to the markets that said, yep, we've signed, we're on board. They didn't get that. And I think to myself, why in the F did Hishilema go to China without getting a guarantee that he was going to get that? I just don't understand these things. Like, why are these guys going for six days and they come home empty-handed effectively? I know he got some promises of a smartphone factory. He got some promises of an upgrade in diplomatic ties. But you can't eat that. Okay? Those are promises in the future. He needed that deal and he needed Xi to convey to the markets that this thing is moving forward. And it didn't happen. So I don't know if you have any other insights on that, but I was baffled by that. No, I was similarly kind of wondering the same thing. And um, for such a long visit, it seemed very underwhelming in terms of returns. And at the same time, you know, it, it raises worries about what's really going on with the dead deal. Like, what don't we know? Like, what's still undecided? Nothing is going on right now. I mean, it's stalled. Honestly, the people advising these presidents and prime ministers are terrible. <laughs> really, really bad. They're getting terrible counsel. Really. They, they don't know, I mean, because you can see what success looks like, okay? Look at how the Vietnamese are negotiating with the Chinese. I mean, they're just killing it, okay? I mean, they're getting firm commitments, firm promises. They know when to play. Oh, by the way, I've got a U.S. aircraft carrier parked in my backyard when the prime minister met Xi. I mean, they play the game well. The Argentinians came back with more than $10 billion of firm commitments, not MOUs firm commitments, okay? Honduras came back with billions in their pocket, okay? Chesakati, Ishulema coming back empty-handed. And I blame the fact that they don't put credible advisors around them to tell them what's going on. Their counsel must be terrible. Why would he go all that way for a week? I mean, does he not have better things to do? Or tell she, like, listen, guy, you're going to have to you know, help me out here. I've got a re-election campaign in three years that I got to run. I need to give my people something. And I, in order to do that, I got to get past this debt restructuring. And you are critical. So either you sign on the bottom line or guess what? I'm going to head over to Washington. They don't play like that. And I just, I don't get it. I mean, I'm just baffled by it. A couple other headlines very quickly here. <laughs> Number one, we got reports this week that the cost of debt servicing in both Uganda and Angola, uh, servicing Chinese loans, has skyrocketed in part because of the declining value of local currencies. And this has been one of the issues that has been a major frustration among many developing countries and prompted a lot of countries to want to join the BRICS. And all that talk about creating a new BRICS currency will in part because they hate the fact that they're reliant on the dollar. Well, because interest rates are high in the United States, the dollar is forcing a lot of these local currencies to devalue, and that's called pushing up the cost of borrowing. So there's been a major, major jump in the cost of borrowing in both Angola and Uganda and many other countries, adding on to their woes already. But what precious few dollars they have is now leaving the country and heading out to service a lot of those debts. We also got a report today that we showcased in the newsletter from our friend of the show, Professor Tang Xiaoyang from Tsinghua University. And he gave a presentation to mark the 10th anniversary of the Belt and Road Initiative at Fudan University over the weekend. And it's very interesting. And he makes, in many ways, the most articulate case to push back against the debt trap narrative. He says, the debt trap is not actually a Chinese issue. The debt trap, okay, not surprising, he blames the U.S., but his reasons for blaming the U.S. are actually quite interesting, and I'd like to get your take. It's not a new take, Kobus. We've been reading about Professor Tang's assessment on this for about a year, but he's refining it. And remember that Professor Tang is very important in the Chinese political system because his ideas do find their way into policy, and he speaks directly to a lot of very important stakeholders in the Ministry of Commerce, the Ministry of Finance, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So this is a guy that a lot of people follow very closely. His contention that he made at Fudan was because Chinese bilateral loans have stalled, as we've seen through the data that Torella pointed to us, and bilateral lending as a whole has been flat or going down, but multilateral lending and private creditor debt has skyrocketed in Africa and other Global South regions. As a result of that, since it's dollar-denominated, it exposed these countries to 
the pressures of the United States Federal Reserve. So when the Fed boosted interest rates, that made the cost of borrowing jump up, and thus we have the U.S. debt trap, according to Tang Xiaoyang. What's your take on that? You know, the interest rate part of the argument, I think it's just math, right? I think, I think it's, it's, it's just true. And, Whether that- and there's been 11 rate hikes since March 2022. So this is not insignificant. And that's hurt you in South Africa as well. Yes. Because these currencies are all getting just pounded by it. Yes, absolutely. You know, whether that constitutes a trap, like a trap set by someone, that's a different question. You know, like it seems to be revealing of larger kind of historical dynamics between the US government and its private sector, particularly the private lending agencies um, and funds that, that lend in large parts to global South countries. So, you know, the trap part of it, you know, kind of is, I think, deserves some unpacking and discussion. But the, the interest rate part of it, I think, is just true. I think it's that these smaller countries are bound to a stronger currency that they don't have any control over. And it's the same problem that a lot of people in Europe complained about by being tied to the euro, that it's great for Germany and France, but it's terrible for the smaller countries and the poorer countries who can't control their monetary policy. So no matter what a poor developing country does, its monetary policy is really controlled in many ways or heavily influenced by Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve. And I think that sense of disempowerment is fueling the grievance that's driving a lot of attention around the BRICS. But I see your point on that. So we have this situation now where the lending is down. We're in this new era. Do you get the sense, and this was the question I asked Terrell, and I'd like to get your take on it, that that this has settled in in the minds of African policymakers, that China is no longer the place where you can go shake the tin can and they're going to put a big check in it. Do you get the sense that in Nigeria, in Kenya, in Egypt, in South Africa and elsewhere that the Chinese are going to be the place to go to for financing projects? You know, on the one hand, I agree with you. I do think these uh, leaders that don't have the kind of advice that they that they could use necessarily. But I think it is also important to differentiate between what they say and what they believe. But how do we know what they believe? Well, no one knows what they believe. But there could be all kinds of reasons for saying it, right? Including possibly trying to put pressure on other finances to play ball with bringing financing or publicly kind of drawing attention to China's failures of financing or simply, you know, kind of like different kind of domestic political reasons to do so, you know. So so it's not because they say it doesn't necessarily mean they mean it or it doesn't necessarily mean that they believe that they're going to get the money. So maybe they do, but I think frequently they're just saying it for other reasons. You know, African political discourse is always very coded and a lot of these things are, you know, messages or, you know, play in the domestic political sphere. So it's always a lot more kind of like murky in terms of what the actual dynamics are. And it's also going to be murky in China as well. All week since BU has released this data, not one single mention in the Chinese press, no discussion of it on WeChat, no discussion of it on Weibo as far as we could see. And that is problematic too, because when you get into discussions with Chinese analysts, stakeholders, even Twitter discussions and things like that, the Chinese side oftentimes is coming completely blind because they don't see this data. It's just not talked about publicly. I'm sure people like Professor Tang have access to it and they focus on it, but in the broader discourse, they don't have it. And this, again, is going to be one of the challenges for the Chinese to update their talking points. And they're going to be surprised oftentimes when they speak with outsiders. They say, well, you're not lending to Africa anymore. And they're like, what? I didn't know that. Literally, there's an information blackout on some of these things. The interesting part of this is that also it plays well for the United States, I think, because the United States now is starting to step up its development finance through the PGI, through IMEC, through Global Gateway. I mean, we can go through all these different acronyms and different initiative programs, but the United States does seem to be putting out more cash now than the Chinese do. And so maybe they stand to benefit from some of the goodwill that the Chinese picked up over the past 20 years, now that the U.S. is actually starting to put some money down, or at least talking about putting some money down. We haven't seen the checks clear the bank yet, but they're talking about it. Yeah, if the money comes through, then great. Everyone doesn't have to be funding at the same time. But the thing is, Africa does have a big funding gap. So if it comes through, great. But like, if it doesn't come through, then that's its own set of political problems for the U.S. So we'll see. We'll see. Okay, so we've got a lot of coverage on the BU report, and obviously debt has been one of our staples for a long time. So 
If this is an issue that you're interested, head over to our website, chinaglobalsouth.com, search on a, the debt tag. So I've got a tag there that every story tied to debt is there, and it's a fantastic archive dating back now five or six years. So you can get a full historical archive of some of the most recent debt stories that are there. Go to chinaglobalsouth.com. If you'd like to read a lot of the stuff, of course, you're going to need a subscription. That subscription supports the independent journalism that keeps us going every day. And we can't tell you how much we appreciate all of our subscribers and our Patreon supporters for making this show and all the work that we're doing at CGSP possible. If you'd like to subscribe to receive the daily newsletter, and all of the great research that we're doing now, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. You'll get a free trial for 30 days, and then after that, it's a very affordable rate. So go ahead and just uh, try it out. If you are a student or a teacher, send me, Eric, an email at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you the links to get a 50% discount for your subscription. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another show. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Tag us on Twitter at China GS Project and visit us at ChinaGlobalSouth.com. If you speak French, check out our full coverage at projetafriquechine.com and Afrique Chine on Twitter. That's Afrique with a K. And you'll also find links to our sites and social media channels in Arabic.